we go. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're, we're very happy to host our friends from, from New Zealand. We are going live now. And we are also streaming on, on YouTube. So um, Derek, I guess you'll, you'll take command. So feel free whenever you're ready, no hurry. This is again, we, we're very happy to, to be here. So it's, it's all yours. O tēnā tātou katoa, e hū mai nei te e tēnē rā. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to our friends from Stonefield School to welcome us with a traditional waiata. We're ready when you are, Mr Miller. Thank you. the karakia can we have toru fa for everybody joining in in the karakia from te kura ona parai pohatu stonefield school Might just need you, Derek, to pick up there with the English translation. I think we're just having a little bit of a sound trouble. I'll I do. Hand it to you. 
Kia ora. Thank you, Sarah. Well, um, kia ora koutou, everybody. And uh, got Derek Winmouth talking. I'm Derek Winmouth. I'm from New Zealand, and I'm the uh, coordinator for the... Oops. We seem to be having a few sound problems. Yes. I will, um, I'll pick up again, but look, thank you uh, very much for the, the welcome from Stonefield School and from, from uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand and the uh, friends I have on the screen with me, I'll introduce in a moment, a big welcome to all those who are viewing uh, from around the world on this 24 hours for change. It's pretty exciting to be the first country up. And as such, we decided that it would be really appropriate to uh, welcome you with a waiata, which is a traditional Maori song, which is a song of welcome, a song to establish our presence here, which was followed a little bit interrupted there in the sound by a karakia, which is a, a form of prayer, a way of just settling us into our meeting together and what will happen uh, across the world over the next 24 hours. So thank you so much uh, to the, the wonderful Stonefields group. We're going to hear a little bit more from some Stonefield students in a moment, as we are from some of our students in Oroiti School and uh, from our colleagues, uh, Rebecca and Steve, uh, a little bit further on. As I'll introduce to each of those in turn, but I, I wanted just to um, use this opportunity to set the scene in terms of what we're talking about uh, for New Zealand, because um, as you will have, I guess, appreciated from our cultural welcome here, and I know that this is a focus for many of the other presentations that are going to take place over the next 24 hours, the, the importance of recognising uh, students as individuals with, an in, with their unique, unique identities, their backgrounds, their heritage, the stories that they have that surround them and make them the people they are is a really important part of our education system. And there's a lot that's been spoken about in recent years about personalizing learning and bringing uh, authenticity and relevance to the experience of learning. And so in what we want to present from the New Zealand perspective, over the next uh, short while or using our hour, are some stories and some illustrations told to you uh, in a large part by the young people themselves that illustrate how this is happening in their experience in classrooms. And we'll finish off with a little bit of consideration then for what this means for the teachers in our classrooms, uh, many who may not be as familiar with that, um, having come through a system where, where the teacher is the person who, who has to uh, be, I guess, committed to, to conveying information or sharing ideas. So at the heart of what we're talking about and what we'll be sharing about in the next hour is the concept really of learner agency, uh, which really for me has three important dimensions. And you'll see these illustrated <clears throat> in, in the stories that are being told. Because agency largely is around responsibility. And we, we've heard a lot about, uh, and I'm sure in this 24 hours and the ones that follow, we'll hear a lot about students becoming more responsible for their own learning, being more self-managing, more self-directed, and so forth. And that responsibility for self is one of the key dimensions. You don't do anything to put yourself in harm's way or to endanger the, 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 your own personal safety or to do silly things that might impact um, the way that you can uh, contribute uh, further down the track. But there's another dimension to agency, which is really the responsibility that we have to others, because learning isn't purely an individualistic thing. It's, it's a highly collaborative thing often. It involves us being able to work and recognize the value and worth of others as they contribute to the, the tasks or the projects that we're involved in. So responsibility to do others becomes really important. And then the third thing is really the responsibility that we all have together for the environment that we share, whether that's the classroom and keeping it tidy and storing the paintbrushes after we've done some painting or whatever, or extending into the outdoor environment and the community environment that we're a part of. So agency isn't just about focusing solely on the individual uh, and him or herself. It's, it's this broader context. And it also involves moving 
from where we're just participants in a learning experience through to where we can be involved much more in partnership with others and ultimately demonstrate the leadership. And you'll hear from some young people from the, the New Zealand context today who, who are doing this, who are, who are being superbly led and guided by their teachers and have taken on opportunities to lead in this way. I just want to finish really with a, a quote that I came across from one of the, uh, the readings that is, is on the, the Future Makers website, which is my website, and I've just put a link to um, where you can find a whole lot of these resources and readings. Uh, I don't want to bore them with you here, but a paper recently produced by Charles Ledbetter and the team uh, that he works with, he, he claims, he says, the school leaving exam should have just one question, which should read, show how you can work with others to combine and use your knowledge to create change that will generate better outcomes for people and the planet while doing what you consider to be the right thing. I think it's a wonderful statement. <laughs> He's provocative in that um, and provoking us to think, what would it be if that was actually the, the question in our final school leaving exam? What would be the evidence that we could bring to show that that's what we have really learned and achieved and can demonstrate at school? That's what I hope in, in the, the minutes that will follow here now with our three uh, guest areas, we'll be able to show and demonstrate. So with that, I'm not going to talk any longer. I'm going to hand over to um, to my first colleague, uh, Sarah Martin, who is the principal at Stonefield School, where you just heard from that wonderful group of students. Um, Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce the, the others that you have in the room and uh, welcome you to share with us a little bit more of your story. Wow. Tēnā koutou katoa, na mihinui ki a koutou, and a very, very warm welcome to Te Kura Ona Pārai Pōhatu Stonefield School in <coughs> Auckland, um, New Zealand. So Stonefield School has a vision that holds the learner very much at the centre. And as you can see here, it's made up of four vision principles. The first one being building learning capacity. We want our kids to know what to do when they don't know what to do. We want them to feel stuck and uncomfortable in their learning every single day. And we want to grow their foundation literacy so they're effective learners and can enable their further, further learning. That second idea around collaborating is we want our learners to engage with diverse others, diverse perspectives, ideas and thinking that is different to their own, and to be great citizens and contributors um, to learning at school, but also beyond in the wider community. Making meaning is that notion of what are the universal understandings, the big concepts, the key ideas that we want our kids equipped with to be great meaning makers of the world in which we reside in. We have a really powerful learning process that sits there too that enables our children to be agentic, to drive their own learning and understanding with the huge scaffold and support from our teachers. And finally, if you like, if you listen to the kids here at Stonefield School, they'd say one of the best things about Stonefield School is breakthrough learning. Breakthrough learning is where learners get the opportunity to pursue their interests, their passions, and as Derek was saying, to take social action, to make a difference for themselves, the community, and the world beyond. So activating our vision is not left to chance at Stonefield School. And a couple of the pieces we were really keen to share with you is firstly, how do our really our teachers creatively design rich opportunities for learning that really hook hearts and minds of our learners and provide those opportunities for them to be richly engaged um, and pursuing really meaningful and relevant learning. So Hope and RJ shortly will share a little bit more about that with you. And secondly, um, we couldn't not talk to you a bit more about breakthrough. So Ollie and we've got Chelsea here are going to talk a little bit about one of the ways in which we provide those opportunities for kids to flourish and thrive and have agency, the power to act um, in their own learning. So I'm going to hand over to Hope and RJ now. Um. Kia ora koutou. My name's Hope Griffin. I'm a teacher at Stonefield School and my name's Ajay. I'm a student. 
So we are going to talk to you today about how we design rich opportunities of learning. Um, so rich opportunities of learning put the learner at the heart. When teachers plan and design these experiences, they often start by asking the learners, what are their passions and interests and how do they link to the curriculum um, objectives and the skills that we want to um, teach? Um, rich learning opportunities often have a low floor, which means easy access for all learners, a high ceiling, which means that we can challenge our learners and extend them and wide walls, which is where we differentiate our workshops and provide different avenues for learners to explore. There are often provocations and exciting activities throughout the learning. And at the end of the learning, an end in mind is clear for both learners and teachers. This could be by the learners designing something, creating something, sharing something with others, or another way of applying their understanding. The key thing about these rich opportunities is that the learners feel freedom and choice, but at the same time are challenged to explore the given area in a way that suits them. Here are some examples of some rich learning opportunities that we've explored this year, and they all aim to link our curriculum knowledge, goals and skills. The slides offer more uh, some scaffold for the learners to follow during their project and the links are um, clickable so you can have a look at them after the presentation. So a real highlight for some of our learners was one where we it's called Wellbeing Wonderland and the learners created businesses. Um, they imagined a business that could be linked to their Tifada Tapafa, which is their well-being, and it was linked to um, maths and art and literacy and a really integrated project. But what do our learners think? Um, here are some slider tools, which is how we uh, find out how our learners feel about the learning and how challenged, but also how engaged and in how much they enjoyed the learning. And so here, the, all those little dots represent our learners and how they felt about the learning that we did together. So now RJ is going to dig a bit deeper into some of the projects she's enjoyed um, a lot this year. So I'm going to hand over to her. Um, kia ora koutou. my name is Ruby Jane. I'm 10 years old and have been at Stonefield School since I was five. I'm going to talk to you about some of my favorite projects I've been a par part of. In these projects, our teachers have scaffolded us with Google Slides and workshops to help us reach success in our projects. First project I'd like to discuss is a project I made for wellbeing. I use the learning process a lot in this project. I first found out what I knew about different wellbeings, such as physical, mental, spiritual, social, and our roots. I next planned what I was going to say in my podcast. And lastly, I created and published a podcast for each side of wellbeing. My second project was on ancient civilizations. We created our own Maldi civilization based on what we knew about Maldi and how they survived. On our journey, we had to identify different Maldi resources, compare cities, and solve math problems along the way. Unlike Breakthrough, we had slides that had helped to support us and help us, and the teachers checked on us every time there was a checkpoint in the slideshow. My final project was called Wellbeing Wonderland. We created places and activities for people to improve their wellbeing. In the project, we had to follow a success criteria to achieve holistic wellbeing for all our guests. My friend and I collaborated and um, to imagine and design a cruise for people to snorkel, fish and relax. This was linked to maths because we had a budget and had to calculate the cost of the entire event and show our working. These projects allow us to use creativity and imagination and also give us freedom and independence in our learning. Now over to Mr. Baker to talk about Breakthrough and Stonefield. Right. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Griffin and RJ. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Breakthrough and what Breakthrough is at Stonefield School. So when you ask our learners what makes them run, skip and dance to school each day, the answer is the same. It's Breakthrough, Breakthrough, Breakthrough. Um, breakthrough has been a part, a vital part of our Stonefield's journey ever since we opened in 2011, and it's both a core learning area and a vision principle. So I'm just going to read out the essence statement here. So it says, the actual act of breaking through, which is our vision statement, is taking action 
Time is value to explore, discover, and pursue interests, passions, and strengths. It is when learners find purpose through using their power and capacity to take positive action in their own life, community, and beyond. And I'm actually just making a connection that very much ties in with what you were talking before about, Derek, about that single statement. Um, so, so through breakthrough, our young people have become pilots, they've become coders, they've become advanced mathematicians, they've looked after pets, they've become chefs, they've become gamers. And while breakthrough as a subject area is a scaffolded chance to let learners explore these passions, breakthrough as a vision principle reverts to that moment of celebration where learners are able to connect their core foundation learners of learning areas of reading, writing, and maths through to meaningful learning experiences. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the progression of breakthrough through the youngest through the school. So in our juniors, very much breakthrough is a time to play. You'll see this amazing sort of allotment of activities where learners are playing in water and learners are playing with visual materials and paints and art and drama. It's a time for them to actually experience new sensations. In that middle school area, which is around your three, four, we sort of try to expose learners to new experiences as well, because sometimes our learners always want to do the same thing for breakthrough. It's sometimes video games, video games, video games for some learners anyway. <laughs> Um, and so it's actually saying as teachers, we have the role of actually scaffolding them into new experiences and actually, hey, you might have tried this, but what, what about this? Breakthrough much in the senior school where I teach, and this is where Chelsea is as well, um, is very much about actually using my strengths and talents and my areas in the foundation skills to actually make a meaningful impact to our community. So some of the amazing things we've done are initiatives around Pink Shirt Day, where a whole school has focused around that, or a senior um, hub has focused around that. We've had whole fair days where learners can use their breakthrough skills to actually create a fair attraction to try and make that impact in the school. I just want to talk about a specific breakthrough for a second. I'm just going to switch that slide. Okay, so here... Um, on the right hand side, this one was a, based around video game design and I'm very much a gamer myself. I absolutely love video games. And this uh, young man on the right here, he was really into Super Mario Brothers. And so he said, I want to play Super Mario Brothers for my breakthrough. Okay, fair call, where's the learning in that? All right, so what his teachers actually did, they actually got him to spatially space out the uh, level in Super Mario Brothers, World 1-1, one, one, if you're aware of it, and actually lay it out in a methodical fashion around the hub. So here are all the little jumps and the gaps you actually have to make in Super Mario Brothers World 1-1 one, one in real life. And he actually also, writing wasn't really his jam, but he actually wrote a walkthrough for that World 1-1 one, one of Super Mario Brothers 1 as well. So there we can see through his love of video games and breakthrough, we're actually engaging his spatial awareness, his maths awareness, and we're really targeting that writing as well, which is absolutely wonderful. But I'm not the expert, okay? Here is one of the experts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand over to Chelsea and she is going to talk about one of her breakthrough experiences. Hi, I'm Chelsea and I'm a year seven at Stonefield School and I've been here since 2015. And I've had many memorable breakthrough projects throughout my education. However, the breakthrough that I've done at the previous term has probably been the most mem memorable one for me. To me, breakthrough is something that I can look forward to each week and something that brings me joy. For it. And it also helps me build knowledge on things that I am passionate about, all while building my knowledge on other areas of the curriculum. For example, in my year five breakthrough, I did a fundraiser for animals. Through this, I learned more about the charities involved in helping animals, as well as developing skills like well, writing well-structured emails and letters and figuring out statistics. This is just one example out of the many different breakthroughs in which I have structured and completed with the guidance of the teachers while still having freedom of creativity. Another example of an extremely memorable breakthrough is my breakthrough from the previous term, through this breakthrough that was led by one of the year seven and eight teachers, Mr. Baker. I learned lots about writing and topics and topics being related to the LGBTQ plus community. The focus of this breakthrough was to raise awareness about youth in this community and increase visibility for different groups. The end result of this breakthrough that we were aiming for was to paint the crossing that leads into the school rainbow. The great thing about this breakthrough, and all breakthroughs in general, is that although the teacher created the plan for it and is guiding the breakthrough, the students get to plan out everything and be as creative, as, as creative with it as they want to. An example of this, the Rainbow Crossing breakthrough, was the fact that the students were the ones sending out emails to the principal at the Board of Trustees, and the ones talking to companies and designing the crossing. Breakthrough also presents opportunities that can create 
prepare you for life outside of school. Say if you wanted to be, like Mr. Baker said, a pilot, builder, mathematician, or even a dance or an actor, then you can explore your passion for these subjects and prepare yourself for the career that you want to pursue. Another amazing thing about Breakthrough is it's a chance to meet people outside of Stoker School. Say you were doing a breakthrough that was based on your passion for science, then you could persuade, it could persuade you to join a science club, or you could even further your knowledge on science and teach others about science through your own science club that you could create at the school, giving you an opportunity to talk to people that you wouldn't have talked to before. In conclusion, Breakthrough can present so many wonderful opportunities that you would have never met before, as well as presenting you with new knowledge and even new friendships that you have found through common interests. So that gives you a little insight into Stonefield School, and you can see very much from talking to our two learners um, that Breakthrough is a real highlight and a wonderful way in which we um, timetable for and provide opportunity for kids to lead their own learning. I'll hand back to you, Derek. Uh, kia ora, Sarah, and thank you so much to all of the, uh, the teachers and the students from Stonefield. Um, it was it, there was a lot to take in there, and, but I, I'm sure people will have the opportunity to review and revise and to to check in on that and to visit your website and and to find a little more about that. I, I think for me, what you've illustrated so perfectly is the the whole point about what happens when we truly place the learner at the centre, but do that through authentic learning and where the teacher now has a role in terms of scaffolding that learning and helping to support that. So they're not out of the picture altogether uh, in any way. And, and in lots of ways, and I, I took that from uh, some of the things, the teacher is actually now also a participant in that learning process. I saw, I heard some exciting um, ideas there. Uh, so thank you again, Sarah, that's really good. We're, we're running well on time here, in fact, ahead of it. So I'm going to pass on now to our, our next school. Uh, and Rob Arrowsmith from Oroiki School, which is way up in the very far north of uh, New Zealand, and his students who have decided today to beam into us from inside, which, as you hear their story, is a little unusual because a lot of what they do is outside. Rob, over to you. Tēnā uh, Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to go into our slide. We are struggling to get our screen. If you click, click on the on the tab right click above, click on the twenty four hours to change tab. Yeah, the the, the oh. tab on the right of the current one at the top of the screen. You're looking at a tab called Post Attendee Zoom. It's the one next to that, Rob. Post Attendee Zoom. At the top of the screen. On the top, there. Uh, now you want to go to the tab next to it, and you'll find your... Uh, see where it says 24 hours of change? Right, no. right alongside there. No. No, no. Right next to where it says Post Attendee Zoom. There. Go, go to the right of that, and you see a little box, little yellow coloured box on the next tab. Yeah, we can't see it because we've got a screen in the way. Okay. Oh, here we uh, go. There you go. Sorry about that, team. No worries. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, welcome to our student presentation on the teaching and learning in our sustainability class here in the far north of New Zealand. We hope you enjoy our presentation on a few of the awesome things we do here at Otawaiti School. Going back 65 years, Owen Richardson was a former principal of Otawaiti School from the late 1950s to the early 1960s, 
and he was a pioneer back in the day for integrated and experiential learning. His primary focus was learning through the natural environment and art. And so he did a lot of place-based learning before that phrase was coined. He taught students the importance of working together on real problems drawn from the local community. When the school had a complete change of staff seven to eight years ago, we decided to revitalize Elwyn's legacy, which has led to a dedicated sustainability class being created this year. We are embracing Elwyn's legacy and adopting it into a 21st century context. You will see examples of this and hear examples of this in the students' presentations coming next. We decided to call ourselves Ropu Ngayo. Ropu is the Māori word for team, and the word Ngayo is in Māori a girl's name, and it means reflections on the water. The word Ngayo also symbolises expertise and deliberate actions and thoroughness. All of the learning we do in Open Isle is through an integrated project and place-based context. We look at what we want to improve in our community and then all of our learning is woven through that focus. Tapo Bay, for example, with our Sandra restoration project at Tapo Bay, we've learned and developed in heaps of literacy and numeracy skills. We had to contact our local EB, which was a multi tribe, to ask them which plants they wanted us to use. We had to write to organisations for support with funding for the plants and signage. We, we had to plan and improve a science investigation using the scientific method to make a model of the sand dunes erosion, which was combining literacy, numeracy, science and technology. We then used a lot of math to work out how many plant seeds we needed to buy to plant at Taco Bay to stop the sand dunes from eroding. Acrylic in the area of sand dunes, I'll be more fertilizer way more. We also learned about the importance of talking to Iwi as we originally bought 1,000 of the wrong type of seeds for the area. We also improved our presentation skills as we had to give a presentation at Tapa Bay to community groups to show our progress so far. Our learning in Roku Nile is always relevant and important as we are doing real life projects that are that we see the impact of our local community. Topo Bay Dune Restoration is one of our major projects. It is one of our local beaches where loads of us hang out to swim and surf and dive. It is really important to many of us and, and we want to make sure it is preserved for us to enjoy the future generations. Tamara has mentioned the planting at Topol Bay and Elia is going to talk more about this after me. The Adventure Playground is probably our biggest project this year in our area of Te Hiku. This is the far north of New Zealand. There are several playgrounds for smaller children, but not so much to do for older children and teenagers. We have some land at our school that is not really used. So we decided we want to create a space where risk uh, where we come to take responsible risks through an adventure playground, including a mountain bike track. We want to use local contractors, maybe, and many people have offered to funding, support funding and the physical work. It will be super cool for us to leave this legacy behind and see our future whānau versus families use it. We, we know we can do this as a few years ago, another class designed and, and got funding to build an outdoor class room that is being used in our orchard today. We have our own beehives that we maintain with the support of local beekeepers. We have 
these fruits and everything. We have been making our own honey. Well, the bees have for about five years now. The beekeeper extracts the honey and honey for us and we bottle it in our kitchen at school. And we sell it at market day and the garden safari in JK to raise money for our projects. We have also worked with a member of the food community around health and safety side of food production. And we have designed and made details as garden as garden supply. And this is usually our biggest earner each year. We get to decide which projects to invest our money in that we have raised. In Rotary Nile, we are involved in all of the in all of the decision making from how our classroom looked to what and how we are learning about throughout the year. At the start of the year, we had a massive brainstorm about the things we wanted to improve at our school and in our local community. We used a SWOT analysis to decide which things we could make the biggest difference to in the time we have with the resources we can access. We all have a say in which projects we take on and how we're going to tackle them. This is just part of our day-to-day -day learning. We have been taught active listening skills and how to coach each other so that we make sure everyone's voices are heard, not just the loudest. When we work together as a whole group, we use restorative circles and a talking stick for the same reason. Otherwise, some people do all the talking. We are responsible for tech. With big projects like the Adventure Playground, we are responsible for researching what we need to do and putting that into a project management timeline. We then have responsibility for finding and calling local contractors to give us quotes for the work. We have learned through this process the importance of confidentiality as we live in a small community. We have also learned that the lowest price is not the only thing we look for in a quote. Our teacher helps us to learn different ways of thinking, but we are in charge of making the final decisions of our project. A few times during the term, we stop and reflect on how each of our projects are going, and at the end of each term, we have a whole day of reflection to decide what the focus of our learning will be for the following term, and how we will do it. We think about what has gone well, what hasn't, and how we can make improvements. Nothing is ever seen in stone, as that's not real life. The maths and writing that we do throughout the year that links to our project work is regularly assessed by us and our peers. And we set our own goals around exactly what we need to work on, and that is going to help us reach our next steps. We check in with our teacher that it's a good goal and plan. Then it's up to us to work on it and reveal it. Adventure Playground. The Adventure Playground has taught us many project management skills, such as ideas, planning, analysis, communication, research, trialing, and evaluation. There have been, lot of diff there has been lots of different literacy and numeracy skills integrated through this project. We also work with an expert on creating our vision, values, and mission statement for this big project so that we don't lose sight of why we are doing it. Our vision is to grow children's self-confidence on the adventure playground so they can feel comfortable and risk-taking. We also learn about the golden circle and how we should always think about the what, how, and why of our project. We all know we are at different stages in our learning, whether it's math, reading, writing, spelling, art, science, PE, or learning to do. We know the most important thing is to know what we're learning, why we're learning it, and how we're going to reach our next steps. We have all learned how to support each other to do this using a growth mindset. We have, le we have learned lots of different strategies to identify where we are in our learning and how to grow. One of our favorite learning strategies is using flashcards as we can easily make them to test our progress. We get to choose if we do this on our own, in pairs, or groups, and it's easy to see where our gaps are. Thank you for listening to our presentation.
Thank you, Derek. Derek, you're on mute. You're on mute, Derek. Okay. But look at that. Um, thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you for, for so much for that presentation. There was so much uh, similarity between Stonefields and Oroiti School that I hope our international audience are appreciating that here in New Zealand, we do have an opportunity to, um, to make full use of our, our broad environment, but that when we do that, it's not about um, setting aside the rest of our curriculum and learning that in the stories from Stonefields and from Oroiti, the, uh, the integration of those important aspects of learning from literacy, numeracy, to critical thinking skills, to planning, to being able to interact with others, collaboration, all of these things were evident in those projects. Um, and so I applaud you and thanks particularly to the students. Your, uh, your explanations were fantastic. But none of this happens in a school situation without the careful planned guidance of the teachers. And I want to recognise in both uh, situations too, the, the enthusiasm of the teachers involved comes across that clarity of mind, that clarity of thinking. And so I've invited um, Rebecca and Steve uh, to be a part of our New Zealand presentation because they are they are. Uh, a couple of people who are doing some pretty interesting stuff when it comes to helping build the capability of teachers to be able to plan, design, and implement these sorts of programs in schools. So, uh, Rebecca, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage and uh, look forward to what you have to share with us. Kia ora tate from around the globe. Kora baka toko ingoa. And ko te piri toko ingoa. I'm Steve. Um, and hearing these stories today is so empowering. And, and having spent time at Oroaiti School with Rob and the kids, um, their, their pictures are amazing. What you were looking at was actually a tree house that was designed by the kids that they had built. And I've been in the room when they're phoning contractors and I've been into their duck pond and watched them collect honey. Everything you saw there is so genuine and Rob's so enthusiastic about that learner agency. Um, it's really proud for me to see them present today. So thank you, Auto AT School. And hearing all of these stories of empowerment actually makes us think about, well, how do we get that same enthusiasm and empowerment for our teachers? Um, so how do we do that, Steve? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a question, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a good question as well. You know, as we've watched and as we've seen students move from that stage of compliance, through engagement to empowerment, which, which we've seen uh, so far today, you realise what the real purpose of education is and you realise how magical schools can be. Um, and so our challenge and the area that we work in, which is teacher development, is to find ways that teachers can share that joy and empowerment, that same joy that we're engendering and growing uh, in our students. That makes sense, Steve, because we all know if we keep doing the things the same way, we get the same results. And I guess we've been curious and what we want to promote is exploring what PLD might look like for teachers when we do PLD professional learning with them instead of to them. Because when you think about it, we should have the same expectations for teacher growth and development and empowerment and joy as we do for our students. And what we've discovered as we've worked in this area is that the first step the most important step, and the, uh, and I guess, yeah, the, the basic step is listening to the voices and the stories, uh, as we have done so far today, but listening to the stories of teachers, isn't it, Becca, and listening hard. That's right. And the COVID actually um, presented a real opportunity for us, a unique opportunity to examine and reflect on the ways in which we work and to see if we as professional learning consultants can do better and do right by our teachers. Because the pandemic did present um, education with, with an opportunity. It gave schools a brief window of opportunity to seize their na own narrative and then create their own narrative, rather than as they were used to having the agenda set for them all the time by external, well-meaning, but still external forces. And this was really emphasised in the, in the flurry of the initial outbreak of the pandemic, when external information and directives was happening very quickly and often a little bit belatedly. So um, what we wanted to do was to get the idea of taking that power away and, and giving it back um, to the schools and then creating their own narrative. 
The question was, and the primary question, as we always ask ourselves, is how do we do this? Um, and Odo Aiti had it right. In fact, before we ask how, we need to go to that golden circle and, in fact, go back to thinking about why. Why should we do this? Um, and it, what we wanted to do was to help teachers reflect and pause and think about who they were first. Um, and this step, we felt, was always missed out with professional learning. Um, you know, the context and who we are is so important before we start thinking about changing things. So we wanted to create tools that empowered schools and empowered them through a process of fairly intense reflection, identification and prioritisation and also celebration of who they were and what they were. We wanted to create simple to use tools that allowed schools to rediscover um, not only who they were, but where they, or what they, who they wanted to be. In other words, to rediscover their why, their heart, their Māori. That's right. And, you know, it's often said, and I say it to teachers lots, the best professional learning is normally down the corridor or in the classroom next door. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to give chances, the, uh, give schools a chance to um, make those internal connections and seek that expertise out within their own walls and then use their strengths that they have to filter and control the change. So, and we also, on the way, want to bring some fun and some joy back into, into the whole process of, of teaching and learning. So we created, to do this, uh, our own fictional school, called Weary Weary School, uh, and our own, our own kind of like jargon or language which goes with that. Now, leaders and teachers can escape into this, what is a basically fictional but safe place to, um, to, to look at big things. Um, it makes them, and, and it's, if you like, it's, it operates as a mirror. It's not directly about them, but it reflects them and it's based on the stories and the voices that we've heard, the scenarios that we create, that is. Um, if it makes them laugh, then that creates an efficacy as well. And it's within a neutral, safe space to, as a starting point. Now, it might look a little quirky, but that doesn't mean to say it's not very, very effective. We wanted, after all, the primary, one of the primary drivers here was to take the fun that we try so hard to create in our classrooms and spread it into the staff room. So we kind of flipped the theory of change, um, the usual process where information is passed down in a transmissive way to our teachers. We wanted to flip that process and system on its head. So at Engaging Learning Voices, um, this is what we, we consider the process of change should look like for our schools. So it starts, as, I've, as we've said, with, by listening to the voices and then creating um, a fictional space, a fictional environment that mirrors those voices. Teachers and schools can then reflect on these things and then by using a simple tool that we've developed for each of the scenarios, carry out their own contextualised review. This provides them with their own narrative and it shines a light on the direction they should or could take. All the time, we feel this is still honouring their uniqueness and their mama as a school. Having achieved this, having gone through this process, schools then have a foundation to own and integrate and innovate from. And they can use this process as shown on this diagram to do this. But most importantly, because the voice is their own and because the, 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 the uh, reflection is informed internally, it's more likely to be owned and therefore more likely to be sustainable. All of our tools, we like to think are aesthetically pleasing and fun, but the fact that we use a narrative pedagogy approach means that it's backed by researchers. We are crazy. <laughs> um, we, we, we kind of like want to, we think there's a real need to build a bridge between the academic research and the realities of trench warfare uh, in, 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 the, in the classroom, the chalk face, um, no man's land. Um, <laughs> so that, that's, the, that's the, the path we wanted to, um, to walk. And a bit like, I guess, kids leading their own learning for the teacher, it can be really messy. This diagram kind of represents that messiness. Um, so teachers learning should also be messy. Um, what excites us actually is um, when we hear that teachers have actually used our tools and taken them and that they've innovated and adapted them to suit their own. So what you're looking at here is a tool that we created at the height of the Omicron wave called Pulse when we collected student voices and they were telling us they missed connections in distance learning between their peers. We heard their voices and Steve's very talented at drawing and he's, he's put together this image that we use lots. But hearing how teachers take this image and adapt it for their own environment, that's what actually gets us more excited.
So again, it's that neutral space where students can identify who they are and who they're feeling about and build a narrative around that. And I always remember a story you told me, Becca, about a little girl who was coming back to school for the first time. And when she was asked to identify on this picture who she was, she pointed at the student nervously looking into the classroom from outside. But she said, but, but I'm also this person dancing on the desk. And when asked to explain her story, she said, well, it's my first day back at school and I was really nervous and scared about coming back. I've been away for a while, but I've been here, I've stayed here. I feel really brave and proud. Therefore, I'm dancing on the desk. Now, that story is very empowering for the student, very empowering for the teacher to hear, to reconnect that relationship. But would that story have taken place if a neutral, safe space hadn't been created where that student could, could express themselves? And in another way, we've got a tool called the garden, which is, um, again, where staff can start to unpack who they are by using the metaphor of a garden, weeds, flowers, garden, shed. Now, if they were talking about their school directly, then there may be some hesitance because it's personalised. But the fact they're talking about it through a metaphor through and creating a narrative around, around weeding a garden means they can bring things out and discuss them and use that as the basis to, 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 to create their own narrative from. That's right. And I guess we see our, our job as consultants as not as dictating to teachers what can happen, but using another garden metaphor, actually clearing away the weeds and, and clearing a path so that the process of change is clear for them through their reflection. And we actually prefer to walk alongside them as they walk this path. So basically, in, in, in conclusion, all we want to, all we are trying to do in our work with the teachers is exactly what you've seen the teachers doing with the students. We think the process is exactly the same because it's working for the students, and why wouldn't it work for the students? So, hey, thanks for listening, everyone. To uh, to close with the Amari uh, Fakatoki, which is a proverb, Tohaina or Paenga Kitaal, which means share your gifts with the world. Uh, thank you again for listening, and have a great um, twenty three hours that remain. We pass you back to to Derek. Kia ora, um, uh, Steve and, uh, and Rebecca, that, that was really fabulous. And it kind of did what I hoped would, would happen here is just bring the focus back to the fact that this is, this is achieving this change, which is what the, the focus of this 24 hours uh, is, 24 hours for change in education, involves everybody. It's a, it's a multiple, uh, multiply layered kind of thing. I, I'm going to use a little bit of time that we've got to share some final thoughts in a moment, but I'd love to go back uh, to our, uh, our schools and just ask a question. Start with you, Sarah, because I think uh, Rob and Rebecca repeated what you guys started with, and that's that's that notion of the why, you know, and you represented that so well. And I just want to come, I guess, as we start off and we see these exciting things happening in schools, and for some people, this is a huge step. This is a big change. So my question is, how would you describe or explain the, the why? Why do you think it's so important that learning begins to look more like what we've been sharing today in schools? I think when we look at attendance rates, et cetera, across our nation, um, our kids are not turning up because they don't see the relevance for them sometimes. They're not seeing themselves in the learning and that we've held on to this very traditional view of siloing um, curriculum areas, whereas life doesn't happen like that. So how do we ensure that the learning inside our schools reflects actually life? Um, one of the researchers I'd touch on, Derek, that was very influential in establishing our vision was Chek Sen Mihai's research around flow. We're talking about thriving now. The terminology's changed. I don't think the idea has, but that sense of fulfillment, purpose, happiness, and learning in life, um, it, it can and it needs to happen in schools is what I'd say. That's that's a great answer. Thanks, Sarah. And and Rob, you've you've got you've made a big thing about the connections in your community in your um uh, projects and some of those really great examples that you your students were sharing that. I, I just want to flip to you and say, why do you think that is so important in terms of so thinking beyond just the bounds of schools? What would you say to that? Um, I would say that the making connections for the students in a real life context is absolutely vital. I mean, it's teaching them so many skills now and for the future. And, it, and you know, these guys are, are the experts. These guys come from here. They're, they're you know, they, they live in this kind of rural community and they've, they've been born here and brought up here. I wasn't born and brought up in a rural environment. So 
I go to these guys for their expertise. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe you could flick to one of your students and ask them the question of, of what, what they think is, is for them, what, what's the best thing about learning in this way? Someone um, there going to answer that? We, we don't. Uh, I love how we um, learn in different areas in different ways instead of just um, uh, readings now, writings now. Um, it's very fun. It's different. Fabulous answer. I don't know whether, Sarah, you've got any students still sitting in the background there to, to flip to? to oh, they've, that. Zoomed, they've zoomed back onto their they've learning. They've zoomed back. Group. That's fine. Yeah, they're watching the live link, though. <laughs> well, that, that's great. They'll hear this. So, look, I, I left out a little piece of my introduction because I wanted to create time for uh, our presenters, and I'll, we'll have a, a final wrap-up. But I think it's, it, it's appropriate just to share with you some slides here as we finish off that kind of will help summarize this from the perspective of this being um, something that we're doing, as I say, around change. And I've just got five key ideas here about how we can go deeper in our learning in schools. The things that for educators who may be watching this, it's important that we, we kind of let go. And the first one is this. I think we've got to stop prescribing, imposing on kids a narrow set of content. It's and I think uh, each of our presenters did that. And Steve, at right at the end, you you made specific mention of this and what you were talking about. That schools and schooling can often become and has in so many areas become very prescriptive and very narrow. And that excitement and the embracing of broad things uh, that we've heard today has gone. And so instead, we've got to start personalising in the way that we've talked about. And, and support the development of the uniqueness of, of each uh, learner's creative and entrepreneurial talents. And I'd add to that, each teacher's creative and entrepreneurial talents, because we want to keep our teachers engaged and focused in our schools. The second thing, as we're thinking about this idea of going deeper through this way then, is we've got to stop thinking about our teachers as just people who need to be fixed, if you like. And this is the work that uh, Rebecca and Steve are doing so well, that we, we can't do this by thinking we want to train our teachers ready to do this. It needs to be done on the ground. And we need to be thinking about empowering the kids and the teachers, liberating them to, to be the people that they need to be. Stop getting this idea of teachers needing to be the experts before they can pass on to the kids. And I think we heard that wonderfully amplified in the stories we've heard. My third point would be we've got to stop constraining the learning opportunities to the immediate uh, physical environments. And the Oroiti students and, and uh, Rob's work there illustrates us beautifully, as does what's been happening in Stonefield, that, that the world your oyster, there is there's a lot of area that we can go into. And so we start engaging them in learning opportunities that exist locally, regionally, globally, beyond their class. And today's activity is a good example of how easy that is to do. And then fourth, in going deeper, we've got to stop forcing kids to learn what adults think they're going to lead. And that, that last comment we heard from the student at Oroiti School kind of reinforces this for me, that, you know, they've got things they're deeply interested in. And so instead, we want to give kids the opportunity to engage in creating authentic products like the honey, like the uh, the playgrounds, like the rainbow crossing, these things that we've heard about today, so that learning is, is fully immersive and it's, it's authentic and it's relevant and not just in case type of learning. And then lastly, as we're thinking about that, it's all about the, the tail wagging the dog at the moment is often about the measures of success, these international test scores and other things that often we can feel constrained by and therefore it, it impacts the, the teaching that we do. And instead of that, we've got to start inventing what that excellence for the future is. And this is why that why is so important. And thank you, Sarah, for the way that you uh, responded to my question, because that's that's the thing that's in the heart, I think, of, of educators anyway. We can't we can't fix, as I say there, the horse wagon to get to the moon. We've got, we've got to build rockets. We've got, to, we've got to do something quite different. 
And so it's a transformation that we're looking at. Um, so that that's sort of uh, where I thought I might finish here, and I'm having trouble just manoeuvring to my to stop sharing to come back. But I think I'd like to give a final voice just to to the guests that I've had on here, and I'm I'm going to go in reverse. Start with uh, Steve and Rebecca. Final thought, really, on on why this change is important to you, Derek. If I can interrupt you for a second, oh. we have a one question from the audience that we oh, might we have. answer before we do that. So if you, if, uh, sure. Daniela yeah. from the audience is saying uh, whether students can can tell us how they'd like to shape their, their learning process from now on. But I see from Rob's that they may be not there now. Um, well, they, my guys, they, they're shaping their um, next steps by going and doing some athletics training. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Gabriel. Sorry we didn't have the students right at the end for that. But uh, so back to Steve and Rebecca, just that question I asked, you know, carry on from here. Why is, why is this important to you? Um, I mean, we're really passionate about making sure that um, everybody is part of that process we see we, we get to talk to everybody in our weekly interactions we get to talk to the the media the press the caretakers the fano and we have that privilege if you like of that global perspective of how education is an ecosystem and that everybody is working within that ecosystem so we see the value in everybody's voice being part of that change process and the voices we've heard for the you know since the pandemic started has been something needs to change. Um, we find ourselves with well-being um, being tricky to manage because of our experiences and trauma that some people have been through lately. And, and COVID has pulled us all together and just amplifying and hearing those voices back to the people who own those voices and encouraging everybody to want and will change. Um, we always talk about change in education and it's always hard to make that change happen. But listening to the voices and, and listening to our kids and listening to our teachers will help in that process. It needs to change because we need to create schools and environments where young people can thrive, not just survive. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And that's um, coming, Rob, if I can flick to you, because, I mean, I guess the question I'd ask you is, so what would be your advice to anyone who's listening to this about where to start? I mean, you started off, uh, referring to the work of Alwyn Richardson, you know, 60 odd years ago. And so there's a long tradition. There's a there's a lot of stuff that's happened. You yourself are passionate, the kids, the parents, the community have done. But if, if you're in a school where none of this has been happening and none of this has been experienced, what would your advice be about where to start? Oh my gosh, um, that's a really, really good question. Um, I guess uh, I, we, I, I always refer back to when I started up here seven or eight years ago and I came um, fresh into teaching and from a, a more of an urban background and I started uh, I wanted to get to know the students and so they took me Ealing down at the river and I guess like you just got to just take a risk take a responsible risk and have a go and get involved and just learn from the students and listen to the students and and their whānau. Right. And that aligns wonderfully to what Steve and Rebecca are talking about, of course, with listening being the central part. Sarah, I want to come to you as a round off. You're a, you're a school leader. You you had the problem of just starting a school, building a staff, building a culture where this sort of um, leading uh, the change has been so important. What, from your perspective as a leader, is the most important advice you would give to other leaders who may be listening to this? I think I agree with what was just said, that our learners, our children are our biggest teachers. And I think we need to prioritize and provide the opportunity, which means how are we timetabling for that? How are we thinking about how time is used? Something I'm deeply curious about, and I think we can do a great job in leveraging off the beautiful gift that was given to us through COVID, but is how do we leverage our community strengths more and truly deeply partner with parents and partners in their yeah. child's learning. I think there's some deforming and limiting beliefs that sit in there that parents say goodbye to their children, but there's just such strength. And, you know, we've been talking about the ecosystem um, just touched on. 
and how we really leverage that. You know, parents who were providing workshops and you had astronomers, you name it, that kids were richly learning from and about their careers, you know, we can capitalize on that moving forward and making the learning even more real and relevant. Um, yeah, we're all teachers, aren't we? Our kids, our parents, it's um, how do we do this better together, I guess. Sarah, that's, that's wonderful and, and uh, such um, harmony between all of the, the presenters here. I just want to pass on my thanks to my New Zealand colleagues. Um, we, we, we've got such a rich resource of, of experience here in New Zealand and you've done such a fine job at representing this, the, the very best of what's happening in our country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So uh, with that, Gabrielle, I'm defer back to you and um, uh, it's all yours from us. Thank you, Derek, Rob, Rebecca, and Stephen. It, it's been fantastic, absolutely wonderful. We we are, of course, recording and we will publish this video. And I'm sure it'll be an inspiration for many people around the world. So thanks for the work you're doing. Thanks for showing us the, the road ahead in education. You couldn't have said it better. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much to everybody watching us. We're going to take a, a two-hour break as we move from east to west. Uh, we're going to transverse uh, the vast ocean now. And we'll be connecting with our friends in Brisbane, in Australia, in a couple of hours. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you.